Arriving from England are the Royal Rhodesian Air Force's first Canberra bombers. Long-range, high-speed jet aircraft, which will give the Air Force far greater striking power should it ever be needed. The Rhodesian crews were welcomed on arrival by His Excellency the Governor-General, Lord Dalhousie, and by the Federal Prime Minister, Sir Roy Walensky. In charge of the flight was squadron leader C.H. Paxton, who paid tribute to the aircraft and the Rhodesian crews who flew them. The Canberra is a particularly compact fighting machine with little room left for comfort and luxury. They're fitted with ejection seats, but after inspecting one, the PM seemed to say, oh, not for me, I'll stick to driving locomotives. Salisbury's entertainment facilities expand into a wider sphere with a new Mabel Rain drive-in theatre, the largest in southern Africa. From over a thousand cars, there's a perfect view of the giant screen, 126 feet wide and 54 feet high. Superb equipment accounts for perfect projection and sound, which is piped into the cars free of the distraction of audience reactions. Drive-ins have certain obvious advantages. And of course, there are no parking problems. None of that, you get the tickets and I'll park the car about it. You all go in together. The adults pay, but kids under 10 are admitted free. At the Mabel Rain, there is a modern cafeteria. So you don't have to rush your evening meal before getting there. Another advantage is that the whole family goes and you don't have to worry about babysitters. Get them ready, take them to a show, then pop them into bed when you get home. Rast off with all the spanners and mucking about necessary to tighten up driving belts, farmer Hugh Elliott of Quickwe put his inventive brain to work. He reckoned that if the generator could be hung on a gate, the job could be done in seconds. His invention enables the fan belt of a car to be adjusted while it's running. No spanners and no frustrations. And of course, bigger units can be adjusted just as easily. Over to the open pit workings at Enchanga, where a million and a half pound solution has been found to removing millions of tons of earth which form the overburden covering the copper ore. The party of the first part is a huge bucket wheel excavator which moves around on tank tracks which dwarf a man. It takes a bit of moving and some highly specialized operating. But once it's brought into position, it can really get on with the job. There are eight buckets on the wheel and between them they scoop out about 1,200 tons of earth an hour. Whipping the earth over the top, the buckets discharge it onto a conveyor belt, the start of several miles of conveyor belts. Passing to the rear of the bucket wheel excavator, the sand goes from one unit to another in an elaborate conveyor system which gets it well out of the way. Rather like a railway, the system is controlled from a sort of central signal cabin. At the terminus of our railway system is the Stacker, a 400-ton monster capable of dumping nearly 4,000 tons an hour. It's a costly setup, of course, but it's digging down to 160 million tons of copper ore, and that's well worth digging for. The Wonder Hole at Sonoya Caves is a famous landmark, and the myth of the bottomless pool has recently been exploded by members of the Salisbury branch of the British Sub Aqua Club. A team of Rhodesian skin divers planned an assault with aqua lungs, which were lowered to water level. Although only two divers plummeted to the final depths, the others were ready to assist and render help if it became necessary. And as a matter of fact, it was necessary, and new oxygen bottles were taken down to the two divers while they were on their way up. Conrad 
Fred Wilson and Sergio Crespi were the two men chosen to try to reach bottom. The water was icy. It took them 15 minutes to get down and 45 minutes to come up again. Meanwhile, their comrades stood by. The world record for an Aqualung diver who managed to come back is 355 feet. In this case, they got within 50 feet of that record and within 10 feet of the bottom of the pool. A wonderful achievement which established the pool's depth at 315 feet. The answer to an age-old riddle. Anyone temporarily stationed in Salisbury during the war would hardly recognize it today. Naturally, the layout of the streets is the same, but the buildings lining the streets have undergone miraculous changes. Salisbury has really grown up, and its traffic problems have grown with it. But Salisbury solves its problems, and parking meters are a blessing for shoppers and those making short stops, while for those who have to stay longer, parking grounds are being extended. No one knows the full story better than the city architect's office, which approves the plans of future buildings. The city grows so fast that it's busting its seams. The fabulous Golden Mile is being extended onto the old Belvedere racecourse, and where the last pin goes in, a magnificent new civic centre is planned. Since Salisbury became the capital of the Federation, its outlook has undergone a remarkable change. It's off with the old and on with the new. Or more correctly, down with the old and up with the new. On an upsurge of brick and concrete, the city soars ever skywards. Planned like the spokes of a wheel, the RST building will consist of 21 storeys. Keeping pace with mining, industrial and commercial developments, the government is erecting new office blocks to improve the efficiency of an expanding civil service. Indicative of the expansion of trade, new shops meet the modern needs of a growing population. And a British bazaar company has opened its first branch in Africa with display floors of colossal dimensions. More today than ever, shoppers can enjoy the benefits of competition that has never been keener. The pride of Salisbury when it was built in 1914 Meikle's Hotel has kept pace with a fine new building. How the old place has changed, and how fast the old place is still changing. There's only one way to describe it. It's a renaissance. A renaissance in which Salisbury is being reborn to meet its destiny. A towering expression of brave aspirations.